Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons is for the months of October, November, and December of 2014. We will be focusing on the small book of James in the New Testament, one of the so-called Catholic epistles, if you know what that means. And um, we're going to find a lot of interesting material in this tiny little book. This is lesson number two in that series uh, for October 11 of 2014, entitled The Perfecting of Our Faith. Is it safe for sinful human beings to have perfect faith? That'll be one of the questions we'll want to look at. But before we begin, we should ask the Lord to guide us. Our kind and loving Father, with great anticipation, we open this little book now to see what you have taught us through these words. It's interesting to understand the things that we have learned about this stepbrother of Jesus his background and so forth, and what he might be able to share with us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. May we learn what we need to know is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. James makes it pretty clear in this small book that our main task as Christians is to focus on the life and teachings of Jesus. Focusing on the life of Jesus will result in the transformation of our lives. Think about it. This, is not, this transformation, transformation is not our work, but His. We may go through trials and difficulties, but if we keep our eyes fixed on Him, He will bring us safely home in the end. This means that we need to turn away from focusing on our past sins and focus on Jesus. Now, who would focus on their past sins? Have you ever heard Christians talk about focusing on their past sins? Well, aren't we... Isn't there a book somewhere that tallies up all that stuff and you, you kind of wonder about it? If, it, if it's it, going to come back to haunt you sometime? And you've got to get every sin wiped out and erased, otherwise you're going to be in trouble if there's one sin left on there. That's what I was taught when I was younger. Hmm. What 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 is the status of that idea? Well, if it's true, let's think about that for a moment. If it's true that we become like what we focus on, what happens if we're constantly focusing on our past sins and trying to get them erased? You go nowhere and drive yourself crazy. Yeah. You're, you, you, you're liable to reproduce those sins again and again, right? So I would suggest, now this is a huge tr change in, in paradigm for a lot of Christians, and especially Adventists maybe. I would suggest that preoccupation with dealing with past sins is a recipe for disaster. God tells us we shouldn't focus on our past sins. Who are we supposed to focus on? Christ. We're supposed to focus on the Messiah. We're supposed to focus on Christ. We're supposed to focus on the life of Jesus. Well, what about it? Is it reasonable for us to look to Jesus and trust Him to do the necessary work? I mean, we've said, do we do this work? Are we the ones who, who make changes in our lives? We don't do it. Jesus does it through the Holy Spirit, right? Isn't that what we're taught? We sometimes don't stop and think about that. So if we say perfection is not possible, what are we saying? God can't do his work? That doesn't sound too good, does it? What a wrong inference there. Yeah. Do we think it's too difficult for Jesus to make that kind of change in our lives? Well, what do you mean by perfection? Is it mathematical perfection or is it... Well, of course, that's one of the questions. Let's, let's look at some verses. James 1. We're starting off with our book here. Let's look at the, first, the second and third verses. My brothers and sisters, I'm reading from my Good News Bible. My brothers and sisters, 
Consider yourselves fortunate when all kinds of trials come your way. For you know that when your faith succeeds in facing such trials, the result is the ability to endure. Okay, so what's going to be the result of facing trials? Endure. You're able to stand up. You're able to endure. Peter commented, 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, Be glad about this, even though it may now be necessary for you to be sad for a while because of the many kinds of trials you suffer. Their purpose is to prove that your faith is genuine. Even gold, which can be destroyed, is tested by fire. And so your faith, which is much more precious than gold, must also be tested so that it may endure. Then you will receive the praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed. So what's, what does that suggest? Um, is that suggesting determination? Okay, determination. What else? Anything else? That doesn't sound like we become saints by becoming couch potatoes, does it? It says, Paul said, all who want to lead Christian lives with Christ will suffer persecution. How many Christian friends do you know who are being persecuted? So it's easier to say perfection can't be accomplished and just not try. Well, look at, first, uh, look at 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. My dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful test you are suffering, as though something unusual were happening to you. We rather be glad that you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may be full of joy when his glory is revealed. Do you uh, rejoice when something bad happens to you? Say, good, my faith is being tested. You know, he, he's kind of talking about people pounding on you, not necessarily situations, because if you have persecution, mm -hmm. isn't that kind of suggesting that people are after you? Well, it's a possibility. No, no, I think it, I think it's more than a possibility yeah. because they're having, they're having a hard time. Yeah. I mean, they already, you know, they got thrown out of Jerusalem. Yes. So it's people. Okay. But um, if you look at us today, we don't have that kind of persecution. Not yet. It's, well, the only thing we really have is kind of disappointment. Okay. If, if, um, Are you might, disappointed that it's been 170 years since the Great Disappointment we're still sitting here? Well, could be. But there's <laughs> a lot of people that, um, that expect things to happen with God and it doesn't happen. Yeah. And so there's kind of a test there too also, wouldn't there be? Mm -hmm. if you know, to make sure that God is, God, you believe in his faithfulness, even though you don't understand how he's going to do it at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the question. Here's the big question. Is God the one who tests us? Do we have any control at all over this testing? Do we have? Yeah. But you just said it is is God the one doing it? Well, I asked you. That this is these are two separate questions. Is God the one sending the testing? Well, if he didn't zap the devil before before he started doing things, well he must be. He must have some control because we said that we're told we won't be tempted above what we are able to handle. Yeah. It's sometimes a bit hard to believe at times, but that's what it says. So there's control somewhere. I see. If our thinking was already in the right place, would it be uh, testing? Well, think of people in the Bible who were tested. What about Job? Well, it wasn't God doing it to him. God permitted it. Yeah. And, and in effect, God takes responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it isn't God directly. It's a very... So, so in light of that now, let's go to the next step. Does God allow the devil to test us? Yes. That certainly would be the story of Job, wouldn't it? The story of Job, Job Eve, and, and uh, everybody else down through history. Has, uh, 
I like to er, find interesting here, uh, w James 1, 13 to 14. Yep. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be t tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Where does that begin? That's uh, uh, the, what, the Tenth Commandment? Mm -hmm. The sin begins in your head. It, it starts with your thinking. Mm -hmm. The action is just uh, the <laughs> Not necessarily final the final result. result, but well, there's other things that happen because of the, in fact, it says right here in verse 15, um, then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So, you well, know, maybe, it, maybe temptation is just, um, it, according to their definition, it's a, it's a direction. Because yeah. don't we call we got a little book called The Desire of Ages. Mm -hmm. well, who's The Desire of Ages? It's, it's a desire. So if, if you go by the Bible there, it says that, that you're tempted by your desires. What if you desired Jesus? Does that mean you're being tempted towards Jesus? Well, the first definition you're referring to is really our self-centeredness, the way we, way we were born. I know, but it's still desire. Yeah, I understand. I mean, we're still using that so word. We need to change it to, to other-centeredness. Yeah. Well, look at this. This is the last one of the Beatitudes. Do you remember what it says? Matthew 11, 5, verse 11. Happy are you when people insult you and persecute you and tell all kinds of evil lies against you because you're my followers. Does that sound like a recipe for happiness? You know, uh, one time, you know, I worked for LLBN. And we were having a really hard time trying to get that thing off the ground. But there was a time when nothing went wrong. Everything went good. It made me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think that's, there's kind of something there that, that answers that question. Okay. Well, he goes on to say, this is Jesus himself, be happy and glad, if you go through all these kind of things, be happy and glad for a great reward is kept for you in heaven. This is how the prophets who lived before you were persecuted. Be happy and glad when you're insulted and persecuted, etc., because the reward is being kept for you in heaven. Does that help very much? It doesn't fit with the popular way, majority way of thinking, does it? No. The instant does wealth this, and instant health philosophy. Does this, does this help us to understand Jesus better, maybe? Yeah. I mean, didn't he suffer a lot of persecution and insults and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of scripture supporting the idea that God will not abandon us as we are being tested. You remember the famous verse in Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things God works for good with those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purposes. dictionary out of here so it but but you notice that th that verse is very different than what the King James says the King James says all things work together for good no that's not what the Greek really says the Greek says in all things God works for good so that includes all the bad stuff too well Think, can you think of something really bad that happened that God managed to turn around for the benefit of his people or benefit of somebody at least? Well, him getting crucified. Yeah. What about the flood? God managed to maintain a connection with the human family. What about the ten plagues in Egypt? Showed the impotence of the heathen deities. Yeah. So... The only thing is that wasn't too bad on the Hebrews. No. In fact, they were protected, weren't they? Mm-hmm. Well, what, what's the result of all this trials and endurance and so forth? For you know, this is James 1, verse 3, for you know that when your faith succeeds in facing such trials, the result is the ability to endure. 
So he's suggesting that surviving through trials makes us tougher, right? Resilient. We need to be tougher? I'm asking you. I mean, why doesn't the Lord just make things a little bit softer so we don't have to be so tough? Well, <laughs> does, it, does, it, does it help us to trust God more if we go through trials? I think it certainly lines up our priorities one way or another, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, I, another thing it might do is, um, I mean, what if you trust God and it doesn't work out like you think it should? What are you supposed to do then? Well, and that's a very good question. Are you, if it doesn't work out the way, even you might be praying earnestly for some result that you think is the right thing to happen, mm -hmm. and it doesn't work out the way you think it should happen, what, what should be your response? It's kind of like Job, isn't it, when a lot of things didn't work out the way he wanted it either, uh -huh. and he didn't quite understand why it didn't. Yeah. So it looks like the question was, are you going to stick with God or are you going to curse at him and die? Well, of course, the problem here, part of the problem is if as we're expecting God to do some marvelous things for, for us, we're holding on dearly to the world. We don't want to let give any, up any of our worldly pleasures or privileges. Can God work with us? Well, it's not only just worldly stuff. It could be, it could be things that are just wrong in your head. Mm -hmm. and you want to give us an example? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I can't think of something at the moment, but mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that I've got yeah. some ideas that are kind of need adjusting. <laughs> okay. I think well, we all do. James, James says this. James 1, starting with verse 2. My brothers and sisters, remember this is a gender-inclusive version, consider yourselves fortunate when all kinds of trials come your way. Do you consider yourself fortunate when trials come your way? For you know that when your faith succeeds in facing such trials, the result is the ability to endure. Make sure that your endurance carries you all the way without failing, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Perfect and complete. Are we perfect and complete? Lacking in nothing? Mm -hmm. So that, that's what happens with endurance? Isn't that what James says? You know, sometimes I kind of wonder if, um, just this kind of illustration, but what if an army came down and they were rounding up sympathizers with the enemy? And they come by and, and they look at you and leave you alone and leave. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> actually, um, if they would have taken you, well then um, you would have been more... Um, there would have been an action there that proved you were more loyal mm -hmm. to, the, to your side. It's interesting that there's a lot of parallels between the book of James and uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And I don't know how I got way down here in my handout. All right. Hold on here just a second. There we go. Do you agree with James that faith will lead to testing when, which will result in patience and ultimately perfection? Could we as Christians on this earth become perfect and complete? That's what it says in James 1.4. Is it possible for us to become more and more like Jesus? And I quote now from Great Controversy, page 555, it is a law. What's a, what's a law? 
When we say law, what does that mean? There are two kinds of laws. Yeah, it's the order of things. Yeah. When we're not talking about a law passed by Congress or something, we say a physical law, a biological law, a chemical law. That means the way things work, right? Description. A description of that, the way things actually work. It is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. That's why we shouldn't be focusing on our past sins. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Great Controversy 555, paragraph 1. Look at a couple of passages in the Bible to compare with that. Ephesians 4.13. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people, that's another word for perfect, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. How does that sound? The very height of Christ's full stature? That should be pretty awesome, right? Yeah. Well, look at Philippians 3. 12 to 15. I do, now, now this is Paul, having said that we're supposed to reach the full stature of Christ, he says, I do not claim that I have already succeeded or have already become perfect. I keep striving to win the prize for which Christ Jesus has already won me to himself. Of course, my brothers and sisters, I really do not think that I have already won it. The one thing I do, however, is to forget what is behind me. What's behind me? Uh, sin my past sins especially, and do my best to reach what is ahead. So I run straight towards the goal in order to win the prize, which is, which is God's call through Christ Jesus to the life above. All of us who are spiritually mature, that's perfect, should have this, should have this same attitude. But if some of you have a different attitude, God will make this clear to you. So what's our attitude supposed to be? Look forward. Look forward. God can do it. The Holy Spirit can do it. We just need to give him the opportunity. So we need to focus on Jesus. Does God actually promise perfection? Look at that verse in Ephesians 4.13 again. And so we, sh we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people. And the word mature there is the word that's translated perfect. Reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. I mean the very height of Christ's full stature. What's that? Perfection. Is that a promise from God? Now let's be very clear. Who does that? Do we do that? God does that if we just give him an opportunity. Now this doesn't mean we're going to say, look at me, and I can't even do that. <laughs> look at me, you know, I'm perfect. No, that's not what, what did Paul say we must do? Constantly striving for the prize. Constantly moving on. So that's, that's not suggesting that um, you are doing, you are perfect by striving to the prize, right? If you mess up, you just push it behind you and you just keep going to God. So, When we get to heaven, do you think we'll get to know Jesus and God better than we know him now? Would hope Probably. So. Certainly, I mean... Um, we ought to be <laughs> advancing our understanding, which would be uh, knowing God even more Otherwise, we're, we're, it can't be static No. And, uh, and progress. Otherwise, if we're static in our understanding, we have an idol. Yeah. It's a graven image we, we, we have. And, uh, so if we get to know Jesus better and better, that's it, like and eternal. by beholding we become changed, what happens? That's an offer. Perfection is an offer rather than a command, is it And not? how long will that go on? Eternity. So perfection then is not a destination, but a what? But a process, a journey. Did Jesus ever say anything like that? Do you remember? 
When he talked about the farmer who plants the field, the seed in his field, what happens? What What's the first thing you see? The little, the first leaf, right? The first blade of grass. Is that blade of grass perfect? And it's assuming, progress. Well, assuming that you know it has the normal nutrients and so forth, the farmer goes out there and he says, "Hooray!" You know, he's excited about it. He, he didn't say he doesn't complain about the, the 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 blade of grass because it's not got a kernel, kernels of wheat on it yet. It's perfect at, for its stage, and then it grows up and it forms a stalk and it forms a head and eventually it develops the wheat. And basically, the farmer rejoices about each stage along the way, right? And so long as it's not dying, so long as it's not becoming diseased and so forth. Every stage, he says, yeah, that's, that's where it's supposed to be right now, right? Is that the kind of perfection that God's expecting of us? Well, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> obviously? We, we were a little, a little slow in that response. <laughs> well, we're always looking out for the trick question. <laughs> okay, I see, okay. Well, James puts it like this, James 1, 5, and 6. But if any of you lack wisdom, do any of us lack wisdom? Don't answer that. <laughs> you, should, you should pray to God who will give it to you because God gives generously and graciously to all. But when you pray, you must believe and not doubt at all. Whoever doubts is like a wave in the sea that is driven and blown about by the wind. So what do those verses mean? You must believe. <laughs> okay. So if you, if you pray to God, say, I need wisdom in dealing with this problem that's before me or whatever it is. I need wisdom to know how to move ahead. Then what? God is do, going to do what? If we pray earnestly, God will give us wisdom, James says. By the way, what is wisdom? Is it the same as knowledge? It's whatever Solomon had. <laughs> When he was acting like a fool, you mean? <laughs> I mean? Knowledge you can soak up by rote. Wisdom is what you collect as you mature along the way, I think. It's a combination. Yeah. There's knowledge Certainly. in there. But it's the university of hard knocks. I had a patient that came to see me this afternoon, and he actually it was his the wife was the patient, but the husband came with her. And he says, I have a question, and I explain to him what his problem was and what he could do about it. He says, that's amazing. Where did, where did you learn that? He says, how long have you been practicing medicine? I said, probably longer than you've been alive. And he said, what? <laughs> it turns out he was born about two years after I started practicing medicine. <laughs> oh, he says, you learned a few things over the year, right? Over the years. <laughs> well, so wisdom is something that well, we might, sometimes we jokingly say wisdom is what you learn in the University of Hard Knocks, right? Mm -hmm. What's the University of Hard Knocks? <laughs> experience. Life experience. Life experiences. Have you ever noticed that it's sometimes hard, to, especially with young teenagers, hard to tell them? Hard to teach them something? Nah, I don't believe that. At least they act like they don't believe it. Until they have to go through the experience themselves. And, oh, it's, it's uh, Mark Twain once said uh, when he was 27, he couldn't believe how much his father had learned in the last 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Some of us go higher up Fool's Hill than others before we wake up. <laughs> I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, let's look at some other passages. Look at James 1, 19 to 21. Remember this, my dear brothers and sisters. Everyone must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Does that sound like good advice? Human anger does not achieve God's righteous purpose. So get rid of every filthy habit and all wicked conduct. Submit yourself to God, submit to God, and accept the word that he plants in your hearts, which is able to save you. 
I've got the new King James. I like this. Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Rampant, rampant wickedness. Rampant wickedness. And receive okay. with meekness the implanted word. But look at chapter 2 of James, verses 15 and 16. Suppose there are brothers or sisters who need clothes and don't have enough to eat. What good is there in your saying to them, God bless you, keep warm, eat well, and if you don't give them the necessities of life. So it is with faith. If it is alone and includes no actions, then it is dead. I mean, James didn't waste any words, did he? He told, he told it like he, like he believed it, right? And look at chapter 3, verse 13. Are there people among you who are wise and understanding? They are to prove it by their good lives, by their good deeds performed with humility and wisdom. Well, James seems, to, at least, to be saying that you can prove your wisdom by doing good deeds. I mean, how many of us would argue with the idea that Christians should be, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry? Doesn't that sound like something Christians ought to do? Mm -hmm. Did Jesus ever become angry? Depends how you interpret it. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's why I asked you the question. <laughs> yeah. but he didn't he didn't lose control. No. And yeah. He didn't lose control of his emotions. Right. And he cleaned out the temple. He had a reason, a good reason to be angry, but he didn't lose the whole situation by any means. It's very interesting that you can read in James two I'm sorry, I'm thinking about James now. In John, the Gospel of John, chapter two. Very early in his ministry, Jesus cleaned out the temple the first time, turned over the, the tables of the money changers and chased out the animals. And Ellen White says that after that experience, the, the Sanhedrin got together and said, why did, we run? why did we run? There was just one of him. Why didn't we stop him from doing all that? He made us look like fools. And they said, if he ever tries that again, we're not going to run. Guess what happened at the end of his ministry? <laughs> uh, yeah. He did it again and they ran even faster. <laughs> I love that. But it wasn't a blind rage on his no, part. No, no. He just, uh, uh, those they, weren't, weren't doing the wrong things, weren't, weren't uh, afraid of him. No, not at all. So. The, the, the sick were there, they didn't run. Yeah. The kids were there, they were rejoicing, they were singing, singing and shouting and rejoicing. They didn't see any reason to run. Dr. Maxwell used to say, if a big man becomes angry, who's the first one out the door? The kids, yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> they recognized Jesus was not really angry. I, those kind of stories, I, I love to think about those kind of stories because God must have had a, has, I know he does, has a fantastic sense of humor. Mm -hmm. But also he has a lot of pathos, of passion, yeah. uh, he was probably agonizing over the fact that he had to do it. Yeah. 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 Well, our Bible study guide says, quotes Plato, who once said, wise men talk because they have something to say. Fools, because they would like to say something. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty good. Wise men talk because they have something to say. Fools, because they would like to say something. It's like the uh, one of the I forget. I think it's one of the founding fathers. It's better to say nothing, be thought a fool, than to speak and give no doubt. <laughs> Remove all doubt, right? Remove all doubt. Yeah. How much of what we say is foolishness? If our focus is continually on Jesus, wouldn't we talk more about Him? Are we embarrassed to talk about Jesus? when we deal with people in the world? I think it's always lurking there, in the back of the mind. What's the relationship between faith and doubt? Are they direct opposites? When you have faith that it won't happen, when you have faith that it will happen. I see. 
if I if see. you're on the positive side, well, then you know where the faith and doubt go. Faith helps you get over doubt. <laughs> you know, the, the problem with doubt is it tends to cripple people. Okay, what am I going to do now? And they don't move anywhere. Mm -hmm. Ellen White seems to suggest one place that it's better to move forward even if you make a mistake than to sit and just do nothing. Is that really doubt, though? Because I thought doubt would be something like God said that this is going to happen, and then the people doubt it, and they don't believe it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's not necessarily that they don't know what's going to happen. They just don't believe it's going to happen, yeah. and they know what they're not believing in. You remember the story of the children of Israel at Kadesh Barnea in Numbers 13 and 14? By the way, for those of you who are listening in our television audience, if you'd like to get the handouts that we use here in our study, they're available at our website. That's theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Look it up on the internet. You'll find these materials there. Well, remember that what happened when the 12 spies came back from the land of Canaan? Ten of them says, not a good thing to go in. It's not a good thing to go in. What did they say? Here they are, two of them, carrying a bunch of grapes so large that it has to be carried on a pole between two people. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's one thing. And then a few moments later, they're saying, well, this land is, is, is so evil that it just consumes the people who live there. Giants in the land. Giants in the <laughs> land. I mean, they, what they were saying was obviously self-contradictory. I mean, didn't anybody figure that out? And yet they, they chose rather to believe these doubters instead of, Cain, uh, of, of um, Caleb, and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua, who said, we can do it. And so who, was the people, who were the two men who survived to go into the land of Canaan? Joshua. Caleb and Joshua. Well, when they didn't want to follow God's direction, what happened next? Ellen White says this in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 391, paragraph Four. Now they seem to sincerely to repent of their sinful conduct. When God says, go back into the wilderness, says, oh no, no, we don't want to go back in the wilderness. We'll go up and fight. But they sorrowed because of the result of their evil course rather than from a sense of their ingratitude and disobedience. When they found that the Lord did not relent in his decree, their self-will again arose and they declared that they would not return into the wilderness. In commanding them to retire from the land of their enemies, God tested their apparent submission and proved that it was not real. Well, look at Luke, 5, Luke 17, I'm sorry, verses 5 and 6. Apostles said to the Lord, make our faith greater. How does God do that? Did Jesus tell them how to make their faith bigger? This is what he said. The Lord answered, If you have faith as big as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, pull yourself up by the roots and plant yourself in the ocean, and it would obey you. We're just telling him that you haven't got any faith. <laughs> well, I always kind of tried to figure out how do you size faith? Mm -hmm. How do you size it? But it sounds, like, it sounds like Jesus was actually doing that. It's kind of like the kingdom of God, isn't it? It starts with like a mustard seed and grows mm -hmm. to the one of the bigger bushes. What's what's the most important characteristic of a seed? Capacity to grow. Capacity to grow. It has that germinating principle in there that when you put it in the right environment, it grows. Mm -hmm. So what's supposed to, what is our faith supposed to be like? When you put it in the right environment, it grows. Like the seed. It grows. So, how many things can you, or reasons can you think of for trusting God? Do we have adequate reasons? Well, he's given us prophecy, mm -hmm. to, to so, so that for a couple of reasons is to give us some confidence when things come about. They can look back. Hey, I told you, mm -hmm. and. and uh, I think one thing that might be important is to test some of your faith. Actually, actually try some things out. See mm -hmm. if they 
they come out and see if it's if whatever your way you go in life actually works out for the best. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do it like the in response to what the devil said to Jesus, though after forty days in the wilderness, you don't want to cast yourself down off the, <laughs> the pinnacle mm -hmm. of the temple. Well, that's, that isn't really starting small. That's kind of starting <laughs> big. <laughs> well, think of all the stories in the Bible. How many times did God come through? Oh, every time. All the time, yeah. Okay. We suggested in, in our first lesson that the teachings of James are almost all paralleled by teachings from Jesus himself. Look at some examples. Look at James 1, 9 through 11. Put your finger in the James, James there and put your other finger back in the Sermon on the Mount. James 1, 9 through 11. Those Christians who are poor must be glad when God lifts them up. And the rich Christians must be glad when God brings them down. For the rich will pass away like the flower of a wild plant. The sun rises with its blazing heat and burns the plant as flowers, a flower falls off and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will be destroyed while they go about their business. And compare Luke 8, verse 14. This was the Luke's rendering of the Sermon on the Mount. The seeds that fell among thorn bushes stand for those who hear, but the worries and riches and pleasures of this life crowded in, crowd in and choke them up, choke them, and their fruit never ripens. Does that sound like James? No. Let's try another one. James 1.27 What God the Father considers to be pure and genuine religion is this, to take care of orphans and widows in their suffering and to keep oneself from being corrupted by the world. Okay? Pretty clear, simple, straightforward definition. Look at Matthew 25, verses 37 to 40. The righteous will then answer him, when, Lord, did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we ever see you a stranger and welcome you in our homes or naked and clothe you? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you did this for one of the least important of these members of my family, you did it for me. Pretty close parallel, right? Well, look at James 2, 15 and 16. We already looked at that once. Suppose there are brothers or sisters who need clothes and don't have enough to eat. What good is there in your saying to them, God bless you, keep warm and eat well, if you don't give them the necessities of life? Did Jesus ever say anything like that? Look at Luke 10, 29 and following. But the teacher of the law wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And what story did Jesus tell? Samaritan. The story of the Good Samaritan. Did he risk his life to help that guy? He did, didn't he? Yeah. How did he know they were the, those same characters weren't going to come out of the bushes and, and attack him? Well, look at James 5, 1 to 4. And now, rid you rich people, listen to me. Weep and wail over the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted away and your clothes have been eaten by moths. Your gold and silver are covered with rust. And this rust will be a witness against you and will eat up your flesh like fire. You have piled up riches in these last days. You have not paid any wages to those who work in your fields. Listen to their complaints. The cries of those who gather in your crops have reached the ears of God, the Lord Almighty. Okay? Think about that. The rich are oppressing the poor, etc., etc. Compare Jesus' statement from Luke 12, starting with verse 16. And Jesus told them this parable. There was a, once a rich man who had land which bore good crops. He began to think of himself. I haven't anywhere to keep all my crops. What can I do? This is what I will do. He told himself, I will tear down my barns, build bigger ones, where I will store my grain and all my other goods. Then I will say to myself, lucky man, you have all the good things you need for many years. Take life easy, eat and drink and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, You fool, this very night you will have to give up your life. Then who will get all those things you've kept for yourself? Pretty sobering idea. What do you think the point of that one really is? 
Well, I think it's the same thing that James is trying to say. God blesses some people so they can share what they have. He doesn't say he's oh. going to take the poor away. The poor you have with you always, Jesus said. But the people who have money are supposed to be helping the poor people who don't have money. So he didn't give it away instead of... He kept it instead of giving it away, mm -hmm. which probably he got blessed. He, he built bigger bars. So. He was probably blessed by the Lord in the hopes that he would give it, maybe. Selfish and self-satisfied. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what do you think about James' attitude toward the rich and the poor? He's pretty blunt about that, isn't he? Yeah. Compare Paul in 2 Corinthians 4.18. For we fix our attention not on things that are seen, but on things that are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a time, but what cannot be seen lasts forever. Does that sound like he's encouraging us to gather a lot of earthly goods? No. Not really, huh? Well, let's think about it. Do riches tend to make us turn our attention away from Jesus to the things of this earth? More often than not. Jesus himself, where, Jesus himself said, for where your treasure is, what? That's where your heart is. There will your heart be also, Matthew 6, 21. What do we see happening in our world today? Are wealth, education, and social influence creating gaps between the rich and the poor? Yeah. You think that's, that's new? <laughs> I think it's no, but I think it's happening even more now. Yeah. Yeah. Some nations is worse than others, but it's certainly alive and well. As far as possible, are we willing to share our earthly riches as well as our spiritual riches? Ellen White had some fairly strong things to say about this in Signs of the Times, June 20, 1892, quoted in Healthful Living 276 and Welfare Ministry 269. As long as there are hungry ones in God's world to be fed, naked ones to be clothed, souls perishing for the bread and water of salvation, every unnecessary indulgence, every overplus of capital pleads for the poor and the naked. Of course, somebody's got to make a judgment of where you cross that line. Sure. And some people will <laughs> put the bar up higher than others. Yes. As you stated earlier, the poor will always be with us. If there's a wealthy man that wants to do good, but is only sought after his earnings, how does one how does one delegate funds versus trying to get a message across? Well, I mean that's 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 the challenge for Christians, isn't it? Yeah, I mean you wonder the guy's standing out there in the corner, and you wonder if he's drunk, and he's asking for help. Now. The immediate response, if you say, well, what would Jesus do? Your immediate response would be Jesus would help him, right? But yet Jesus came back to his hometown and he didn't help any, didn't heal anybody, didn't do anything for anybody. Why? <laughs> hmm. Well, James seems to suggest that what really matters is our attitude toward money. What does he mean by the attitude toward money? Whether it rules you or whether you're prepared to help others with it. You've probably heard of the golden rule in modern terms. He who's got the gold makes the rules. Right. Yes. It's called Gold's Law. Gold's Law? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, some actually want more because they want to help others. Others want more in order to indulge their wishes and wants. And a world that is consumed with keeping up with the Joneses, getting and spending more money, how do Christians maintain their proper attitude toward money? Well, Ellen White puts it this way, God would have his servants become acquainted with their own hearts in order to bring them to, to a true knowledge of their condition. He permits the fire of affliction to assail them so that they may be purified. 
the trials of life are God's workmen to remove the impurities, infirmities, and roughness from our characters and fit, the, fit them for the society of pure heavenly angels in glory. So now I have a, I'm going to read you the rest of the quotation in a moment. But now in light of that I have a question. Why is it necessary for us to go through this terrible time of trials and troubles and persecution and so forth to prepare us to live in a world that's perfect where there aren't any trials and tribulations and troubles? Doesn't that sound like a contradiction? Well, you got the trials and troubles they have to get rid of somehow. They have to be put down somehow. How are they going to get put down? Unless, you know, what it, we need to go through whatever needs to be gone through. Okay. Will be excellent examples of how Christ uh, can pull you through. Yeah. Then as we pass through trial, as the fire of affliction kindles upon us, shall we not keep our eyes fixed upon the things that are unseen, on the eternal inheritance, the immortal life, the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory? Ellen White says, and while we do this, the fire will not consume us, but only remove the dross. And we shall come forth seven times purified, bearing the impress of the divine. Volume 1 of the Testimonies, page 706. Well, the Bible tells us clearly that at the end of time, things will be like they were in the days of Noah. What was happening in the days of Noah? Marriage and giving in marriage and all that goes with it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think Noah found it easy to preach for 120 years while everybody's scoffing and laughing at him? No. And what about the time of Jacob's trouble? What's the parallel with that? Remember? I have some pictures of the small river called the Jabbok River. Remember what happened to Jabbok? Jacob was fleeing from Laban first of all and then he heard that, I, that his brother Esau was coming and he was sure that his brother was going to make good on his threats from before. So he sent his family across the river and he stayed behind. Suddenly someone grabbed him and he fought for his life, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Well, but who was he fighting against? An angel. Maybe even Jesus himself. Yeah. Do you think you ever had that kind of an experience? Not quite physically like he did, but are there times when we almost have to fight with the Lord? Do we understand how God perfects faith? What is faith? A biblical definition of faith, based on, all of, based on all of Scripture, as stated so well by one of God's best modern friends, Dr. A. Graham Maxwell, is as follows. Faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. We can't say will be. Why can't we say will be? Who knew God very well and ended up being a rebel? Satan. Sure. So faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based on the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe what he says as soon as we're sure he's the one saying it, to accept what he offers as soon as we're sure he's the one offering it, and to do what he wishes, as soon as we assure he is the one who wishing it, without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. That is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. Faith also means that, like Abraham and Moses, God's friends in the Bible, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. Now, I think that's a definition that we all need to think about. That's a very, very significant, says some very significant things about faith. 
How much did the thief on the cross know Jesus when he turned to him? Well, Ellen White tells us that actually the thief on the cross knew quite a bit about Jesus. That at one time he was almost ready to become a disciple of Jesus. And then he said, you know, there's no way that this one obscure rabbi could be right and the whole Jewish nation be wrong. And so he turned away from Jesus and got into all this trouble and ended up being a thief and got caught. And so then he realized after they were actually hanging on the crosses, cross, that this was the Jesus that he had almost been a follower of at one time. He said, yeah, this guy is real. The way he's acting. So you, you say that he knew him before. Yes. Even though they both, at the beginning, were kind of mocking him. Yeah. He realized who he was. and yeah. Well, true faith and wisdom reveal themselves in good deeds. That's what James says. Do they tend to make us proud or humble? Faith, of course, must grow. The problem with earthly wealth and means is that it tends to turn our attention away from Jesus. So where does true wisdom come from? Remember what James 1 verse 5 says? But if any of you lack wisdom, you should pray to God who will give it to you. Because God gives generously and graciously to all. So have any of you had the experience of saying, boy, I just can't figure this out. I don't have wisdom to deal with this. Pray to God and then just all of a sudden you know the answer. <coughs> That's the way it works? Sometimes. Fine with me. <laughs> Sometimes. Well, it's interesting how... how we don't have time to go through this now, but if you look at Hebrews 12, verse 2, actually, maybe we should just look at that very briefly in the few seconds we got. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. He did not give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him, he thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross, and he is now seated at the right-hand side of God's throne. In light of that, okay, Compare what we've learned today in, from the book of James with our verse found in Revelation 14, 12. The faithful people of God will keep his commandments and they will have the faith of Jesus. They will look to Jesus as the author and finisher of their faith. Try it.